go. Streaming from South Africa to the world. To the world. This is the Stonks Go Moon podcast. What just happened? We break it down so you don't have to. Welcome everyone to the Stonks Go Moon podcast. My guest today friend of the show, best-selling author of the book, The Tower of Trading, founder of Options Academy, Simon Ree. Simon, welcome to the pod. Hey, Rocco. Great to see you again, mate. How are you? I've been working. I'm very excited about this. I've been working on my Jerome Powell impression. So for those, go for just, go check, <laughs> let, just, just look at this look on YouTube. Okay. That's, that's a <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, yeah. that's JP uh, last night. Had a bit of a nervous start there, and then he sort yes. of slid into it. And I feel he got a bit of you know his swagger back, and um, so much to unpack. I I mean, everyone was saying fifty basis points, um, and then later on the consensus came you know seventy five basis points. Um, what did you make of it all? Well, what happened? Obviously, Friday was a last Friday was a much higher CPI figure than people were expecting, mm-hmm. and I think the Fed saw that number and and panicked, and and rightly so, right? They they've been hoping that they can jawbone inflation down. Uh, I mean, we, we have seen a massive tightening of financial conditions. And I think they thought that markets would basically do the job for them. They didn't want to raise rates. They're worried about what it'll do to the economy. They're worried about what it'll do to the stock market and all the rest of it. But they saw the CPI figure and they went, oh, shit, we might actually have to do something. So Jerome Powell got one of his staffers to uh, call the Wall Street Journal and say, look, we, we need you guys to leak a story. Oh, yeah, that, uh, the Fed oh, yeah that, was, to, uh... that was the most <laughs> obvious leak of all time, right? That was so obvious. Right. Yeah. Um, so the Wall Street Journal ran with that. JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs obviously picked it up, revised mm-hmm. their forecasts. And I mean, honestly, the, the, the Fed would have seen the CPI figure and gone, you know what, we, we've actually got to get serious here. But they would have looked at the market. The market was pricing, you know, a 20% probability of a 75 basis point hike. Mm-hmm. And they would have thought, damn, we, we've, got to, we've got to get that higher. We, we've got yes. to get the market pricing this. So you've got to, you've got to admire the execution, right? They, they, they kind of reset market expectations in a very short space of time. And then, you know, to, to his credit, he came up with the goods, gave the market a 75 basis point rise. Um, there's been a lot of crit- criticism online about it because it's, you know, the, the people are worried about recession. But, mm. you know, I, I think people at this point are in la-la land if they think inflation is going to come under control without a recession, really yes. and truly. Um, if, if, they main, if the Fed maintains a trajectory of slowly, slow but steady tightening towards a terminal rate of 4%, Yes. We're going to end up with sticky inflation and a recession, and and it's really the worst of both worlds. Is this you know, if they can people, front end load this. Uh, sorry, go on. No, no, no. Explain to people that might not know what is sticky inflation. Sticky inflation. Well, inflation that doesn't go away. Okay. Uh, last time we had that was was in the seventies. So it just just persistent price hikes. Now, it doesn't okay. mean inflation is stuck at eight point six percent. Yes. But you've got a, a regime of you know, much greater economic volatility. You know, inflation will rise and it will fall and it'll probably rise again. Yeah. But um, it's, it's, it's the worst of all worlds if you've got a recession and high, high inflation. So you'd, you'd so, sort of rather yeah, have one or the yeah, other. Yeah, yeah, no, I completely with you. But to me, it's, it was sort of, I was listening and then it's, it's sort of what you said. They woke up and realized, oh shit, now we have to do something. And what, what they actually done they could have just done nothing as well it's don't you think it's just like oh hey we are look we, we did something but it's i mean 75 basis points it's not gonna not inflation is not gonna go away no it's not but look at the look at the dot plot okay so the dot okay. plot has been reset uh we're looking now at a, a median expectation from among fed members members yeah. of a 3.4 percent rate by the end of 2022. Yeah. All right. So we're we're looking at, you know, possibly a a 75 and 250s to go. 
Okay. Or a 75 and a 50 and 225s or, you now, know. Interesting. He said this was the last 75, didn't he? No, no. What he said was he didn't expect it, it'll be common. But then in the next <laughs> breath, he basically contradicted himself and said, but we could go 75 in July. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Pinky promise. We pinky promise. <laughs> Won't be. Yeah. What was more interesting than, okay, when, when we passed the notes and, and you know, sort of, oh, okay, uh, the market took it like it did, uh, massive uh, 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 SPOY climbed, uh, tech climbed, um, gold rallied, and then obviously we had this little sell-off today. But what was interesting is the panel discussion, and I'm wondering where these financial journalists actually get their accreditation from, because I'm looking, as a, we went through the questions the one and I, well, the one lady I asked asked him, um, "Are you trying, or is the Fed trying to induce a recession?" And I was like, "What are you expecting to say here?" I mean, obviously, he's not going to go yes, and obviously, it's ludicrous. It's a ludicrous. Yeah. You know? I mean, they'll never tell you that a recession's coming. Yeah. You know, even Bernanke at the precipice of 2008, was you know, his famous quote was, it's contained. The, the problem in subprime is contained. The Fed chairman's never going to say, yeah, you know what, we're going to cause a recession. Uh, it's never going to happen. Um, two things. Uh, interestingly, he said markets are forward looking. That's a very popular trope that even I and some other people use um, sometimes. It, it just is mm -hmm. interesting to hear him say that. Well, I mean, he did, but he, he made he made a he made a bunch of comments in in the presser that were a little bit incoherent, or yeah. not incoherent, but inconsistent. I mean, he was talking about housing at the end there, and he he said, you know, housing will probably still keep going up even though rates continue to rise and home buyers probably need a reset, which is, you know, indicative of a, a pretty pretty tough path ahead, I think, for a, a Fed chair to make a comment like that. Yeah, and then the last one was. Um... <laughs> what made me um, raise my both of my eyebrows was he still sees the possibility of a soft landing. Yeah, but what else is he going to say? No, I mean, but, it gets but, back but to the, then, yeah, we, we're going to engineer a recession he, here. Okay. Okay. But then, Simon, why, why are we having these press conferences afterwards? Uh, is it a show, you know, that dog and pony circus show for just sort of for the media? Because like you said, what are you expecting him to say? Exactly. Well, I, mean, I guess that the important part is is the guidance. All right. Yeah. And yeah. we know that 75 is on the table for next month. And we know that we're, we're looking at potentially you know, nearly three and a half percent by the end of the year. And we're currently at one and a half to one point seven five. So okay. it's a pretty aggressive tightening path uh, for the back end of this year. And none of these things are things that the stock market is going to love. Yeah. And that brings me to my next point is. Some people are interpreting this as bullish. Um, I've yet to see someone put out a thesis that I can buy into about why that would be. To me, this is still a sell the rips environment, meaning every bounce, mm -hmm. three consecutive candles, you would look for re-entry short. Um, what is your view? Yeah, I think we're, we're in a sell the rip environment as well. I mean, you could put a a very short-term bullish argument in that it, it removes a major area of uncertainty, markets mm -hmm. hate uncertainty, uh, and maybe that just gives us the, the market the excuse it needs for, for a bit of short covering, which mm -hmm. can, can, you know, short covering rallies can be pretty fierce. Uh, and this is why bear markets can be tricky to trade because short, short covering rallies tend to be so ferocious. Just explain to people what short covering rallies are. So short covering is when people who have shorted a stock, i.e. Mm -hmm. sold a stock they yes. don't own on the expectation of profiting on falling stock prices, yes. lock those profits in. All right. So they, they will buy, buy their short positions back. And mm -hmm. when this happens en masse, uh, you've got a new marginal buyer in the market, which causes prices to rise. Okay. That's a very good explanation. Um, so, I mean, we can say with a high probability there is more downside um, in the short term. And one of the questions that I've been getting a lot, especially from people in Europe, not so much in America, is how do I protect my long-term investments? Because when, like, and people say buy and hold, as in that's the blanket statement and it applies to everyone. But I mean, you might 
like retire in the next five years or in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. And believe me, they're looking back at the 1970s, if we are in the 1970s, there's no guarantee that we are going to reach all time highs again in the next decade, right? There's, there are no mm -hmm. guarantees here. So that's my question becomes, um, and I think everyone's wondering, how can you protect your portfolio um, in the short term against these um, downside market moves? I mean, the, the, the simplest answer is to just raise cash levels. I mean, cash, cash in a bull market is a, it's a temporary situation because you, you kind of, you, you're buying the dip. Cash mm -hmm. in a bear market becomes more of a, a permanent part of a portfolio because it, it, it protects you. But if you want to go a step further than that and actually do something a little bit more active, you can look at buying put options. Uh, okay. A put option is, it's a derivative um, that increases in value when stock prices or stock market indices fall in value. Okay. Um, so that it's a, it's a way of, uh, I guess, making money from falling stock prices other than short selling. Sh short selling is tough, all right? Because yeah. if you get it wrong, um, you think about it, if you buy a stock and you get it wrong, the stock price falls and, and you allocate, say, 5% of your portfolio to that stock, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it becomes 2.5% of your portfolio because the stock price is halved, it literally becomes a, a smaller and smaller problem. Yeah. Right? Because yeah, it yeah, yeah. becomes a smaller and smaller part of your portfolio. If you short sell a stock and it doubles, yeah. It goes from a 5% position in your portfolio to a 10% position. So it becomes a bigger and bigger problem, okay. which is why short selling is, is really, I think, beyond the remit of most people. Yeah. But if you buy a put option, you don't have that headache. Um, the, the most you can lose is the premium that you spend on the put option and, and your okay. theoretical upside is, is unlimited. Okay. So how, how easy is it for people? Let's say, I mean, I'm not like... I'm a novice, right? I bought some stock maybe last year when the markets were going up. How is it? How easy is it for people to get into, um, let's say, buying a, a put option? Well, I mean, it, it's it's more complex than buying a stock um, okay. because when you're trading options, you've got a bunch of different strike prices to choose from, and you've got a bunch of different expiration dates. So. Okay. There is more knowledge required when it comes to trading options versus trading stocks. Okay. That's not to say it's difficult. You, you just need to learn how to do it. But there is a learning curve and it's important for people to know that there yeah. is a learning curve. It's not just you pick something up and you do it straightforward. Yeah. If you just open up a brokerage account and start yeah. hunting options, you know, it, it's unlikely to uh, end in financial success. Well, we've basically seen that. Sorry, I'm not, I'm, we shouldn't laugh at this, but we've seen it at the beginning of the year where we warn people, like even going back to the kickoff sessions with Darren um, in December, that, hey, this is going to come. And But people rarely heed warning calls because it's contrarian to their position. So you're saying something that they're not maybe familiar with or they're not liking. And the moment it happens, mm -hmm. right, we usually say, well, now it's too late. And But in this case... I, I'm, I'm talking to people in the energy space, for example, <clears throat> they've been in the industry for 45 years. Um, and he, he told me that the, he hasn't seen anything like this in his lifetime, where we've got, for instance, rising oil prices. We've got a strong dollar. Yeah, the dollar is taking a dip now because there is rates, but it's still strong. There's crashing emerging market um, currencies. And we've got China opening up now um, at the same time. So it's like these more. So my point is these market conditions are historically not maybe we haven't seen it historically uh, when you look back. So you sort of need that guidance. Yeah. Well, I mean, to your point, um, Stan Druckenmiller made the exact same point in an interview at the uh, Sony investment conference a few days ago. He mm -hmm. said he doesn't ever recall a time in his 45-year career as a CIO where there's just been no historical analog to the current situation. Yeah. So that that that, that you know he, he's echoing your comments exactly there. For um, I haven't read that for for the listeners. Who is that and like what is his background? Uh, because I think everyone needs to go and read that. Yeah. So Stanley Druckenmiller, he. He trained under George Soros. He, he worked with George Soros in the quantum fund. He was uh, Soros's protege, and he's got a, 
a pretty incredible track record as, as an investor and as a market commentator. I mean, like all of us, he doesn't get it right all of the time, but yeah. uh, he's certainly got a, a great track record. He's, he's one, of, one of the goats of the investment world. Okay, and we'll put those links so people can go and read it. Simon, thank you so much for joining us today. Before I let you leave, um, as usual, some of the um, plays or setups that you may be looking at in the short term and uh, what you have on deck. Well, really, I'm, I'm looking for I'm looking for a rally to, to sell into. Uh, mm. And when I say sell, I mean, I really mean buy puts. Um, yeah. you, you don't want to short in the hole. I mean, I, I think a, a short covering rally will, will happen at some point. It looked like yesterday was the start of it, but looking at the markets today, mm. oh, S&P futures down 2.5%, NASDAQ futures down 3% now, so uh, we can forget about it. <laughs> Looks like we can forget about it for now. Um, I, I think yen looks interesting here as well. I'm looking at um, buying some call options on uh, on yen futures Okay. Uh, with, with the view that uh, the Bank of Japan, I mean, their yield curve control looks like it's... Uh, they're losing that battle okay. and if they do actually tell the market tomorrow that uh, hey look we're going to step back from this yield curve control 25 basis points on the japanese government bond mm -hmm. uh, i think we could share a short squeeze in, in yen so that's that's a, another little setup i'm looking at that's but, but really point, I'm, yeah. I'm not looking to buy too much down here at all mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking for the next rally to, to sell into yeah i mean what do you always say picking tops and bottoms is a mugs game right yeah, I mean, just just follow the trend. Follow the trend and bear market is where we're at. Simon, thank you so much for joining me today. If the listeners want to connect with you, where can they find you? And um, what are some of the things that you're busy with at the moment? Uh, they can follow me on Twitter at Simon underscore Re. Uh, I'm also on LinkedIn, Simon Re. Uh, my website is uh, toweroftrading.com. And uh, yeah, look, I'm, I'm busy teaching people how to trade options. I, I run Options Academy. Uh, that that's, sits within my e-learning company, Tower of Trading. And uh, we are all about teaching people how to make money in up markets and down markets. That's the beauty of the game. Ladies and gentlemen, superstar trader and market analyst guru slash wizard best-selling author of the book go and buy his book the tower of trading simon Ree. thank you so much for joining me today and to our, Always listeners, a pleasure, Rocco. <laughs> and to our listeners peace love and prosperity and we'll catch you in the next one cheers <laughs>